So we are having a discussion with the Green Party leadership candidates, and this is a friendly discussion. It's not a debate. The Green Party of Canada has been a longtime ally of Fair Vote Canada. Um, and what, lots of wonderful volunteers for Fair Vote come from the Green Party, and we're very grateful for all the work that they've done alongside us on electoral reform over the last couple of decades. We are also not backing any candidate. Um, we are thrilled to work with whoever wins the Green Party leadership race to get us closer to proportional representation. So if there's anybody here who is actually new to Fair Vote Canada, we are a national citizens campaign for proportional representation. We don't endorse one single model of PR and we are pushing for the last four or five years for a national citizens assembly on electoral reform in the recognition that politicians tend to be in a little bit of conflict of interest on our issue and that doesn't tend to end well. So we would like to put the next step into the hands of citizens. This is a chance for you to get to know the candidates a little bit better, to hear some of their thoughts on PR and electoral reform and how we move forward. In terms of the format for this event, in the first half, we're going to have each of the candidates just introduce themselves. We're going to have them answer a few questions if they like to work that into their introduction that we sent them ahead of time, you know, which is what they think about how we move forward, basically. Um, and we realize that the five minutes each that they will have is not nearly long enough to cover um, what is a rather important and complicated topic. So if they don't get to everything, they'll be able to answer more of that when we get to the Q&A. After each candidate has done their introduction, then we will be having the question and answer for the last half of the session. We're going to start with a French question, but the rest of the event will be in English. And this is where we will look through the questions and answers, questions that you have sent us in the Q&A. So please use the Q&A to put your, put your questions to the candidates. And we'll give the candidate um, as many of these questions as we can, keeping in mind that with six people, we might only get to a few questions. So I am going to turn this over to Gisela to introduce our guests and get us started. All right, thank you, Anita. So I just wanted to let you know, first of all, that I am joining you from the unceded lands of the Shkwetmik and Shkwetmik Ulu. This land covers 180 square kilometers in the central interior of British Columbia, including the confluence of the North and South Johnson Rivers, where the city of Kamloops is located. And that's where I live. Uh, so um, in terms of the introductions, I am going to introduce them in the order that they were generated by our random generator. And I'm going to give a very, very brief bio of each of the candidates. And I encourage everyone who is listening to go to the Green Party website and read the full bios there, in addition to what you'll be learning during their um, opening remarks today. So our first um, speaker will be Sarah Gabrielle Barron. Sarah is a teacher, a business person, and a writer from Manitoulin Island, Ontario. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Politics and Indigenous Studies and a Bachelor's of Education. She teaches all grades specializing in Indigenous Studies, co-op education, and special education. Sarah is a creative writer and a small business owner who has been involved with the Green Party in various roles since 2006. She advocates for the arts, for Indigenous-led self-government, for minority rights and for societal development that honors the realities of climate change. Sarah's detailed platform is available through the Green Party website. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. I've deeply enjoyed this leadership race so far because it gives me the opportunity to reach out to Greens and Canadians alike. Thank you, Anita, Gisela, Nancy, Valerie and the entire Fair Vote Canada team for all the work you have done over the years to promote true democracy in our country. If there is a minority government and Greens are in a position to bargain for a confidence and supply agreement, action on proportional representation will be a high priority for the Greens. It always has been. However, given the reality of the situation, action on hard targets and real realistic solutions for getting down our greenhouse gas emissions is a top priority. The bigger parties will always be opposed to proportional representation. It serves their interest to have 100% of the power with less than 35% of the popular vote. That is not democracy. Canadians should be allowed to vote with their heart, not strategically against the worst case. My plan to move the needle on proportional representation is unique. 
Fair Vote Canada is calling for a national citizens assembly, and I support this 100%. It's a beautiful model to use in, in discussions. And we as Greens aren't providing that within our own systems within. I will be convening policy table talks nightly that any Green can attend. One policy table night, we will be talking about creating a national food security mandate because Greens are already creating the infrastructures in our communities on local food security systems, the infrastructures that future generations will need to survive and thrive in the era of climate change. Another subject of our policy table talks will be harvesting our green knowledge on small scale energy resiliency solutions. Again, those infrastructures that future generations need. And our third subject will be choosing a form of proportional representation. We will have this form of proportional representation picked and present a motion to members for our next general meeting, which I'm earmarking for spring, June, 2023. Then it's my job as leader to ensure that our candidates are all very well informed on how this new form of proportional representation will work. It's my job to ensure that we're all using the same election ready messaging. We should be prepared strategically for a potential fall election. But here's the magic. This process represents our key principle of participatory democracy, democracy in action. One of the most exciting times as Greens and even in the other parties is when we get together at our general meetings and we talk shop. We workshop policy proposals together. And that is the magic of true democracy, real participatory democracy, not a scratch on a piece of paper once every four years, but citizen-led control of the decisions that affect our lives. With my leadership, Greens will experience participatory democracy, direct democracy in so many ways. I'm excited to get started. I hope on November 12th that Greens will have the wisdom to change. Thank you very much, Sarah. Our next speaker will be Chad Walcott. Chad is a community engagement expert with 10 years of experience in politics and social development. A native of Montreal, he holds a bachelor's in political science from Concordia, where he developed his mobilization and governance skills in the student union. He is an experienced fundraiser with a passion for grassroots community organizing. Chad ran for the Green Party of Quebec in the 2018 provincial election. And he hopes to position the party as a resource for building community leaders and to bring positive culture change to the Green Party of Canada. Over to you, Chad. Oh, and I, I was remiss. I probably should have um, just let the participants know that if you'd like to turn off your cameras while you're not speaking, if you feel you might be distracting, please feel free to do so. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gazella, for, uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name, <laughs> for uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, so yes, Chad Walcott, you know, one thing that Anna and I believe in is the need to give Canadians a stronger appetite for strong democracy. Uh, that's something we feel that has been missing of late in our democratic system. We see people who are disengaging from the process, who feel unrepresented, who feel unheard, and we're seeing it through protests, we're seeing it through vast misinformation that's that's running rampant in our society and it's something we absolutely have to address and so as leaders of the green party of canada one thing that anna and i absolutely want to do is invest in building the capacity of our members and our local electoral district associations or as they we've been told by uh, uh, a member of the gpo to say riding teams <laughs> which is more accessible um but we want to increase the capacity of the green party of canada to be a resource for democracy in their communities. Um, in the first six months of our leadership, we want to launch a Green Leaders Network, which effectively will help our members and uh, our local uh, EDAs grow their mobilization capacity, but also learn transferable skills that they can apply in their community to move the needle forward on local initiatives that are important to uh, their constituents. The reason that's important is that we, you know, in order to counter the right-wing populism that we're seeing rising and that Pierre Poilievre is pushing forward, we need to give people the tools to show them that the democracy, instead of tearing it down, it can actually work in their favor. And we can show them how to pull the levers of that democracy to work in their favor. And I think if we position the Green Party of Canada as a resource for civic action in our communities, then we can do the work of 
of bringing people back into the fold and give them an appetite for deeper democracy. What Anna and I would like to see is more deliberative uh, and accountable democracy in Canada. We want to bring forward citizens' assemblies, as Sarah said, and as Fair Vote Canada advocates for our national citizens' assemblies, but also regularizing the use of citizens' assemblies to include everyday citizens in the decisions that affect their lives. We also want to pass legislation that adds responsibilities to uh, each member of parliament, requiring them to hold regular town halls with their constituents so that they can actually do the job of representing you know if we want representation even under a pr system we need to know that our representatives are speaking with their community that they're getting the pulse of their community which is something that i feel is well that anna and i feel is lacking in our current democratic structures um so coming back to the green leaders network but we we hope that aside from being able to equip our members and our candidates with strong uh campaign experience these skills can transfer into knowledge of how their local governments and how their local systems work so that they can help push forward local initiatives within uh, their communities and show that Greens can lead through action and not just through rhetoric as we see in other political parties. We wanna be able to grow our membership base through trust and demonstrated ability to get results. And that's the vision of Canada uh, that Anna and I have for uh, Canadians and for the Green Party of Canada. And it's something we're absolutely excited to dive into and get to work immediately on uh, as leaders of the Green Party of Canada. So on November 19th, uh, Anna and I would love to use our combined 25 years experience in governance, in capacity building and in mobilization to help grow the Green Party of Canada and take us to the next level. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. Our next speaker will be Jonathan Pagnot. Jonathan has been reporting on crises throughout the world since he was 17. He has interviewed pirate fishermen in Somalia, documented sexual abuses by UN peacekeepers in the Central African Republic, witnessed failed revolutions in Egypt and Libya, and documented excessive force by police in places as diverse as Chile, Belarus, and the United States. Raised in Montreal, he describes himself as a gay, mixed-race, single son of a single mom. He recognizes how privileged he is to have been born Canadian and the responsibility that comes with that. Over to you, Jonathan. Thanks for the introduction and thank you so much to Fair Vote Canada for organizing this event. It's quite heartening to see so many uh, so many of your members and so many Greens uh, joining us this afternoon on a on a beautiful Sunday or at least a you know a Sunday that I I assume is uh, better than in uh, Ontario and other parts of the country than in Montreal where it's a bit raining. So I am calling from uh, Trochake, which is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kenyan Kaka uh, Nation. It's been a place of meeting and exchange among uh, several First Nations, uh, and so I want to thank them for uh, their custodianship and for uh, hosting us uh, in uh, in what is of course now known as Montreal. Um, I come to politics from the world of journalism and human rights research. Um, most of my career has been spent in places where people don't have a voice, uh, where people are faced with abuses, where uh, dictatorial powers uh, have uh, uh, promised or, uh, you know, promise elections and fair elections, but don't actually deliver. Uh, and I've seen and met with so many activists throughout the world who are risking their lives to defend democracy, people who are being arrested and beaten up in jails, uh, tortured for their belief that every citizen should have a voice. Uh, this is work I've done, as uh, was mentioned uh, before, in places like Venezuela and Belarus and Nicaragua, but also in the United States. Uh, I was deployed by my former, uh, my former employer to the United States in the course of the 2020 election, uh, at a time when, of course, we know uh, our neighbor to the south was faced with a democracy with a democratic uh, crisis of its own. And it's important to say that we are faced with an equally important crisis of trust and confidence in our democracy here at home in Canada. And that is the result of uh, growing cynicism, which really is a cancer for uh, our institutions, institutions which we will need in order to uh, to face the coming storms that are that will be brought forward by a changing climate, uh, by more and more instability abroad. Uh, we've seen recently with the uh, sadly with the convoy in Ottawa, but also with the Ontario election, that uh, the cynicism of the public is at sky high levels. Um, there are solutions to that. Fair vote is fighting hard, and so is the Green Party of Canada to implement uh, proportional representation. We know 
that we've been promised by uh, status quo uh, parties like the Liberal Party and the NDP that they would uh, also uh, bring forward a system of proportional representation. And these promises were betrayed. And these were tremendous betrayals. Uh, but in order to change our system, we do need to get more Greens elected. That is key here. Uh, we have uh, a few more years now to prepare for uh, hopefully the next election in 2025. It's important that we have a strong team of people who can uh, rebuild the party, stabilize it, empower it, notably by working with our EDAs, by also being able to communicate the importance of proportional representation. And that will be a key message, I, I believe, regardless of who wins uh, this leadership race for the Green Party of Canada, that our democracy is in danger right now and proportional representation is a remedy to this crisis of confidence. Uh, so we need to double down on this message. Elizabeth and I have uh, combined experience as communicators, as, as, as community organizers. Uh, Elizabeth, of course, sits in Parliament. She is is a member, a sitting member of parliament who's dedicated so much of her life uh, to the fight for uh, climate change, but also for proportional representation, sitting on the, com the committee uh, that was established in 2016 and sacrificing so much, uh, just as I have reporting on uh, crises uh, faced in less democratic countries. So uh, we need to communicate this message forward. We need to make sure that Canadians understand, but that by choosing Greens, they will not only get uh, good members of parliament who really care about their communities, who represent them well, just like Mike Morris and Elizabeth and Paul Manley uh, have done, and that we will be steadfast in our demands to have uh, proportional representation uh, if we uh, are so lucky as to see uh, a, a minority government come forward uh, in the next election and as to hold the balance of responsibility. So thank you for the opportunity, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Jonathan. Our next speaker is Anna Keenan. Anna is a professional community organizer with 15 years of international campaigning experience. Born in Australia, Anna holds degrees in physics and economics. She's a former campaigner with Greenpeace International and 350.org. Anna ran as a Green in the last two federal elections and has served as Democratic Institutions critic since 2019. She and her family live on PEI, where Anna was president of the Provincial Greens. She has served on many local and national nonprofit boards, including PEI's Coalition for Proportional Representation, Fair Vote Canada, Bike Friendly Communities, and the Clyde, or sorry, the River Clyde Theatre Festival. Go ahead, Anna. Thank you so much, Gisela. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be back on, on a Fair Vote Canada Zoom. I spent a good three years uh, on, on the Fair Vote board between 2017 and 2020. And so it's uh, it's great to see, um, to be back here in this very different context now. Um, as I mentioned, or as was mentioned in my bio there, I'm, I'm joining you from Ebigwit, one of the seven territories of Mi'kma'ki, also known as Prince Edward Island today. And, and I'm really touched by, um, the, the land acknowledgement um, that Anita used at the start of this meeting to draw attention to the 94 calls to action. So thank you very much for that, Anita. Um, as many of you on this call will know, I've led two campaigns for proportional representation here in, in my home province, um, including one in 2016, which was the plebiscite on electoral reform, which we won. Uh, mixed member proportional gained 10%, a 10% winning margin um, over first past the post. And then, of course, the government decided not to honor the vote. And that was the downfall of the PEI Liberals. Um, within about within one month, they lost 20% of their popularity, and that began the rise of the provincial Greens as official opposition um, here in, in PEI. Um, so I think it's fair to say that that fair voting um, and particularly proportional representation advocacy is a major passion of mine, as it is for, for Chad. We are running in a co-leadership model um, because co-leadership, we feel, represents the best of collaboration. It models collaboration and consensus and power sharing from the top. Um, and, and that's a culture that we want to, to generate throughout um, the party and also throughout Canadian uh, political discourse. We know that um, one of the major barriers to uh, proportional representation is that when a party gets into power, 
um, they're, they're very reluctant to share that power with anyone else or to have anybody else hold them accountable. And that's what proportional representation does. It prevents people from having too much individual power and it shares that power, adding a check and balance. And that's exactly um, what we found um, co-leadership to be like as well, because any individual leader is, is fallible and having a co-leadership model um, introduces a really beautiful check and balance on that system. So we're very willingly sharing power and trying to model that cultural change. Um, I have lived experience with different electoral systems. Of course, in Australia, we have ranked ballots in the lower house and uh, STV in the Senate. I've lived in the Netherlands for five years where they have uh, list, uh, party list proportional representation. And of course, now living in Canada. And the difference between how activists are able to move the needle in countries that have proportional representation versus the systems where we're in, stuck in first past the post and it really restricts the ability of individuals to make change. I, I found it very remarkable when I moved to North America how, how much of a difference it really made. Um, in the international roles I've had, I've worked with activists in Brazil, China, India, Russia, the Philippines, um, and so on. And you can see the way that different electoral systems impact their work. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how much time I have. I assume someone's going to wave at me when I've got like 30 seconds left, but I, I do want to talk about um, self-fulfilling prophecies. And I think that this is one of the things we're seeing in Canada at the moment. There's, there's a huge swath of the population that is losing faith in democracy. And so we're, they're checking out and we're seeing lower and lower voter turnouts in provincial elections, municipal, even federal elections. The, the, the turnout is starting to get weaker and weaker. And of course, when citizens start checking out of their own democracy, um, it leaves the people in place who are paid lobbyists, who um, you know, can spend all of their time lobbying politicians directly, and it leaves control up to those um, up to those corporate entities. And that's the opposite of what democracy is. In democracy, citizens are meant to have control over their future. But we can also flip that self-fulfilling prophecy on its head. Despair and disillusionment doesn't have to be the way. And I think Greens show this. When we succeed, we start to get organized. We recruit hundreds of volunteers. We say that things can be different and we generate an active hope. And when we do that, it does make a difference. And when citizens engage and they volunteer in their communities, then um, they have the experience of, of being empowered and they, it reinforces a positive sense of democracy. So that's what Chad and I are trying to do. We've released our, our platform priorities and right in, in the top of those platform priorities, we're very clear if, great, we, if we can do the work that we wanna do and get into the balance of power, confidence and supply would have an essential condition of proportional representation. We would not enter a confidence and supply agreement without that condition. And we believe that the way to get to implementation of proportional representation is through a citizens assembly so that the exact model um, for proportional representation is not determined by the politicians who of course have a vested interest and that includes Greens, um, but is determined by a, a neutral citizens assembly. I think I've probably used all my time, but I'm really looking forward to getting into the questions and, and thank you very much for hosting us. Thank you, Anna. So our next speaker is Simone Nokini messier Simon grew up in Quebec's eastern townships. He studied political science at Laval. And in addition to being a father, Simon has experience as a federal public servant, a language teacher in the Canadian Armed Forces, an entrepreneur, a city councillor, and a school trustee. Simon was active in the NDP for over 10 years before joining the Green Party of Canada as a candidate and global affairs critic finding within the party values and a vision he can embrace. He believes the party needs to return to its roots, focusing on the six principles of global greens. And again, a, more, a, a link to a more detailed platform is available through the Green Party website. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm talking to you from uh, the unceded traditional uh, territory of the Abenaki in the Quebec province. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, I could add to that. I'm running for the leadership of the Green Canada on the platform of green social democracy. And what do I mean by green social democracy? I mean, traditional social democracy opposes neoliberal capitalism by focusing on meeting the needs of all citizens, as opposed to the neoliberal goal of merely creating more wealth. It tries 
to guarantee universal social benefits. What green social democracy does is to reassume state control over major level levers of, econ of the economy to ensure that citizens, not high tech billionaires or oil big oil company billionaires, determine the economic and ecological future of our society. The deadly threat of global warming requires very large public investments to rapidly move toward zero greenhouse gas emission. This means major transformation in the systems of energy, transportation, and production, as well as the retrofitting of residential and commercial buildings to make them energy efficient. Currently, Greens are in coalition government with traditional social democrats in Germany, Finland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. All have pro proportional representational, representational electoral systems. All have high standards of living and all are up, up performing, outperforming Canada in the transition to carbon neutral economy. The message is very clear here. When you merge green values with social democracy, you have a winning formula. The other message is that proportional representation highly increases the success of bringing greens into coalition governments. We need to elect more MPs. I believe that coalition governments are the way to achieve our goals. We need to be part of a coalition government in 2025, but we must insist on proportional representation as a condition for its formation. I have no doubt that the Liberal Party in 2025 seats will be reduced to its strongholds in the largest urban center of the country, leaving the Conservatives to make major gains across the country, and the NDP will make some similar gains outside of Quebec. If the Greens Party can win 20 seats in 2025, we will be in an excellent position to negotiate a coalition government agreement. And if I'm elected as leader of the Green Party, I will insist on proportional representation as my first priority. Can we win 20 seats in 2025? Yes, we can be electing at least 15 members of parliament in Quebec, two or three in BC, two or three in Ontario, and one in the Atlantic provinces. In Quebec, in 2011, the population tired of traditional parties voted in 59 NDP members of parliament. In 2015, the numbers fell to 16. The NDP is now a spent for it in Quebec. We can win over the remaining NDP voters in Quebec and regain much of the social democratic vote of 2011. The Liberal Party has lost the confidence of Franc Francophones in most of Quebec and has bunkered down it, it, on its strongholds in the highland of Montreal. A resilient conservative party will siphon off some voters from the Bloc Québécois and Liberal Party, while the more progressive voter for those parties could be attracted to the GPC's strong environmental policies. I've been asked what the Green Party could do to push for progress toward proportional representation in Parliament. I'm not going to sprinkle fairy dust in your eyes. With only two MPs, we can't talk the talk, but we cannot walk the walk. This is why we need to abandon uh, failed electoral strategies of the past and rely behind a winning strategy for 2025. So this is my plan. Thank you, merci, miigwech. Thank you very much. Our final speaker is Elizabeth May. Elizabeth is an environmentalist, author, activist, lawyer, and an officer of the Order of Canada. She has been the MP for Saanich Gulf Island since 2011 and is one of Canada's best known parliamentarians. From 2006 to 2019, she led the Green Party of Canada through four federal elections, including the breakthrough 2011 election in which she became Canada's first elected Green. Elizabeth was the executive director of the Sierra Club from 1989 to 2006, and she has written eight books, including a memoir. Go ahead, please, Elizabeth. Hi, thanks, Giza. And thank you, everyone, for being here. This is a fantastic turnout with over 290 people online. So as you could commence avec un grand merci, I also want to acknowledge the territory that I'm here on. Thank heavens, the first time in two weeks that I'm able to say I'm home in the traditional territory of Wasanich Nation. Uh, this is a region where, uh, for a time immemorial, Wasanich people lived here. The language spoken is Senchokan. And so I raise my hands to you in our local tradition of Heishka, Heishka Sam. Greetings, respect, and welcome. 
I also want to start with something a little unusual before I forget. I don't want to take any chance of forgetting because I see that one of uh, one of the people who's a participant here, shout out to Mary Kidnew, who this morning found out she's in a by-election. Uh, Justin Trudeau just announced December 12th is the by-election for Mississauga Lakeshore. So Greens need to know how to win elections. I've been through a few by-elections. Holy cow, Mary, hang on. And I just want to ask everybody online to find the Mississauga Lakeshore EDA account, find ways to send money to Mary now so she can get more lawn signs. Um, I certainly, Jonathan and I plan to get to Mississauga Lakeshore as quickly as we can, campaign door to door, regardless of how the outcome of the leadership race goes. Greens need to show up and make sure that Mississauga Lakeshore, this is a, a, a by-election created by uh, the loss of a, of a liberal MP who was uh, universally admired, by the way, but I won't digress into all that. He's now uh, working for the UN in Myanmar. We have to do whatever we can to show up for Mary. So yay, Mary. I saw all the hands going up here. I also want to apologize. I didn't realize we were all on screen all the time. While we were, everybody else was talking, I was doing some other calculations of, I didn't know our combined work time, Jonathan. I'm honored to be running uh, with a co-leadership candidate as fine as Jonathan Pedro. And uh, I just worked it out, Jonathan, if I'm right, we have 62 years of uh, collective experience in grassroots organizing and activism. It, I mean, by myself, I have a combined 47 years, so it's really kind of ridiculous because I'm 68 years old and I've been an activist consciously doing grassroots work uh, since 1975 on Cape Breton Island where we stopped the spraying of pesticides across our forests, but that's an old story. Our work in electoral reform is what I wanna focus on. And in starting by saying Heishka CM, it reminds me immediately of the electoral uh, reform committee of parliament on which I served. It was exhausting to put it mildly, but it was also an amazing triumph because just as Anna pointed out, the vote in PEI actually won, we turned out a majority report of the Special Parliamentary Committee on Electoral Reform that called for proportional representation. And that's a majority of MPs in a long process. I have to say it, 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 was, um, it was exhaustive and exhausting. And, and I know, Anita, you were right there with us every step of the way, as were fair vote volunteers, because we turned people out in um, 19 different sessions that were in every province and territory. This was, of course, all in 2016. Uh, it was an incredible effort. But I went back, I was just looking. I mean, it, it, I think we need to remember that it wasn't just a liberal election promise. It was in the 2015 speech from the throne to make sure that every vote counts. The government will undertake consultations on elect reform and will take action to ensure that 2015 will be the last federal election conducted under the first past the post voting system. I think we've all too easily allowed the liberals to get away with the most significant political betrayal I can ever remember. It was absolutely appalling and Justin Trudeau should have paid at the polls for such a significant betrayal. Uh, but but what I wanted to remember was the work, was the fact that we also held hearings here on on Wisconsin territory, on in Sartlip. We had uh, meetings with our parliamentarians. The committee went and hosted by Chief Don Tom of Sartlip First Nation, and he invited the chiefs from Pawkachin and Seacom and Sayout, as well as Cowichan and Penelicat that are outside of Saanich Gulf Islands. And we had an extraordinary hearing. And it was really interesting to watch one of the conservatives think he was going to trick Chief Don Tom. Advice to conservatives, don't try to trick Chief John, Don Tom. It won't go well for you. But anyway, he said, so, so Chief, how were you elected? And Don Tom said, well, the same way you were elected. He said, ah, yeah, he said. Uh, under the colonial oppressive Indian Act, our system of governance is, is a colonial structure. And then he proceeded to lay out traditional decision-making and traditional indigenous governance in the society of Wasanich peoples very clearly. And he said, I'm an Indian Act chief trying to do myself out of a job because we want to ensure that our indigenous ways of knowing 
are respected. And he said, in our society, it's the grandmothers, the matriarchs who are really in charge. And a young guy like me will keep his mouth shut in Longhouse. We've gathered by families. And when we make real decisions, he said, you know, our chief and council make decisions because that's the structure we're in. By the way, Sartlet First Nation is still a holdout against Trans Mountain Pipeline. Our Crown Corporation goes into communities like Sartlet and says to chief and council, we have all this money for you in a, you know, in partnership agreements. You just have to say yes to the pipeline. It's happening anyway, just take the money. Sartlip doesn't take money from uh, Trans Mountain Corporation, which is now our crown corporation that we all own. Anyway, I wanted to reflect on how we get PR. I'm so committed to it. So in advance of all the other questions, I totally agree that when we approach, I love you know, Simone's approach, Ad's approach, Chad's approach, as you said at the very beginning, Anita, this won't be much of a debate because I don't think we disagree on anything. We need to get this country to have fair voting. And I just want to add one other piece to that before I, I, I cede the floor. Having first past the post contaminates politics. It changes the political culture from one with any possibility of being co cooperative to one that is toxic and hyper-partisan. I've seen it with my own eyes. My colleagues, our colleagues in New Zealand saw the difference. It took two election cycles for New Zealand voters to realize they could vote for what they wanted and actually get it. it takes a while to abandon the toxicity of elbows out the way the NDP wants to kill us was the same thing in New Zealand before PR. So I'm going to close there and look forward to questions and comments. And thank you so much. All right. Thank you to all the candidates. That was a wonderful introduction from each of you. Um, so I'm going to keep moving this along down to the Q&A section. So we're going to give the candidates some of the questions or um, that have come through in the Q&A. I might not read it verbatim because sometimes several people ask basically the same thing. And even if somebody has addressed it to a particular candidate, I'm gonna give everybody a chance to respond to that question. So we're gonna start with the question in French and Gisela is going to take that since she can speak French and I can't. So, la première question en français, Autre que la réforme électorale, quelles autres réformes démocratiques seraient importantes pour vous et comment pensez-vous pouvoir y parvenir? C'est moi? Est-ce que je commence? Do you want to do the questions in the same order or we didn't even actually talk about this? Je peux commencer. Oui, vous pouvez commencer. J'ai déjà vu, j'ai déjà dit, dit à uh, mon introduction que mon plan est pour faire les, uh, les séances entre les membres. C'est comme une... Uh, it's, it's direct democracy, it's participatory democracy, it's citizen assembly style, and it's also in tune with indigenous ways of having meetings that go in rounds. Et j'ai fait l'expériment Une année, pas, l'année passée, en novembre, euh, quelques grassroots, les membres à la base ont fait euh, une séance dans novembre, euh, chaque lundi en novembre, lundi des propositions. Et était, il était euh, joli, amusant, intéressant et facile. So in November, I convened with some other grassroots greens an experiment called Motion Mondays. And this is one of the reasons why I'm running as leader, is to get that participatory democracy, that direct demo democracy experience it was so easy. And we were workshopping motions that we knew were coming to us at our upcoming general meetings. And like I was saying in the introduction, that's the magic. That's direct democracy. And it's so easy to do. And I'm just, that's why I'm running for leader, because I've been waiting for that to happen in my 17 years as members as a member, and it's so easy to do, and it will come true with my leadership. Merci pour la question. Merci. Sarah, uh, la prochaine personne serait Chad, s'il vous plaît, and we've decided that we're going to use the same order as we used for question one for this question, and then we'll reverse it for the next question. 
Parfait, merci beaucoup pour la question. Euh, puis je réalise que dans mon introduction, je me suis un peu dévancé et j'ai donné la réponse que j'aurais dû donner maintenant, mais ce n'est pas grave. Je vais me répéter puis je vais donner un peu de contexte. Donc, euh, les réformes que moi et on aimerait voir euh, instaurées pour juste, en, en plus de la réforme électorale, ce sont justement les, les assemblées citoyennes euh, et euh, de légiférer pour faire en sorte que les euh, membres du Parlement doivent faire euh, des assemblées publiques, donc des town halls avec leurs euh, leur co-citoyens pour pouvoir réellement les représenter. It's so important in order to have a deliberative democracy and a participatory democracy that our MPs and the people who are elected to represent us can do the job of representing us. And that cannot be done under the current system where there is no incentive or requirement to consult with your citizens. In fact, what we're seeing in our democracy in Canadian democracy right now is more loyalty to whatever color you wear than the people that you're elected to represent. And that's the beauty of the Green Party of Canada and why I joined the Green Party of Canada is because we are free to represent our, our, our constituents. You know, so long as we're staying within the six green values, we have the opportunity to consult with our citizens and put bring their voice truly to parliament. And that's why Anna and I would like to see more deliberative processes through citizens' assemblies and direct consultation through town halls. And I'll give an example from my own personal life of why I think this is important. You know, I, I spent two and a half years working for the city of Montreal. And when I started, my primary role was to interact with citizens and show them how, uh, well, help them navigate this, the uh, municipal bureaucracy, but also show them how to enact the policies and enact the, the initiatives that they wanted to see done. And I was helpful and you know uh, dare i say instrumental in showing them uh how to use the levers of government to their advantage and really i think contributed to to upping their confidence in the systems that that govern us and so i think the green party of canada can play that role at the federal level but also through our our, our green leaders network Anna and i hope to empower our membership to be ambassadors for change and ambassadors for action at the local level throughout the country. Um, so we're really excited to put those policies in place and, and really deepen our democracy and give Canadians a deeper hunger for more involvement in their democracy. Because as we mentioned, proportional representation is one step to ensure stability and ensure more representation, but that alone cannot solve all of our problems. We must invest in uh, ensuring that each member of our society can meaningfully Uh, contribute to the decisions that are made on their behalf. Thank you. Merci, Chad. Une prochaine personne, Jonathan, s'il vous plaît. Merci pour la question. Euh, je pense que c'est essentiel d'abord qu'on euh, amène, donc qu'on qu qu permette aux jeunes de voter, euh, d'avoir une réforme qui va permettre aux gens de 16 ans et plus de voter. Je pense que c'est important, c'est essentiel même. Il faut que les jeunes d'aujourd'hui soient impliqués euh, dans les prises de décision euh, qui vont avoir un impact sur leur futur. Euh, D'autre part, je pense que le ça, c'est un enjeu dont on n'a pas parlé encore euh, ici dans cette discussion, mais toute la question des sondages euh, me paraît être fort problématique. On a euh, énormément de sondages qui sont euh, publiés et faits par différents partis, mais également lors, des, lors de la période électorale. Et très clairement, ils ont un impact sur, euh, d'une part, le désir euh, des citoyens de se rendre aux urnes, parce que souvent, on va avoir une, une impression que, bon, euh, la CAQ au Québec ou les libéraux au niveau fédéral ou le Parti conservateur en Ontario, va gagner, donc pourquoi est-ce que je me rendrai aux urnes si c'est clair que le résultat, euh, ce sera d'avoir un gouvernement euh, de telle ou telle couleur. Donc, je pense qu'il faut, euh, faut avoir des faut qu'on ait des discussions sur la question euh, de, la, de la permissibilité des sondages en période électorale. Euh, le dernier point que j'aimerais amener, c'est la question du temps, parce que pour s'impliquer en politique, ça demande du temps et ça demande des ressources. Euh, le Parti vert est le seul parti qui, de manière continue, euh, euh, donc, met de l'avant euh, la nécessité d'avoir un revenu euh, de base universel pour tous les Canadiens. Ça, c'est un instrument qui peut permettre à l'ensemble de la population de s'impliquer plus dans leur communauté et éventuellement en politique. Présentement, euh, quand on fait face à la crise d'inflation, qu'on a des difficultés à payer notre loyer, euh, qu'on doit amener les enfants à l'école, qu'on est, qu est euh, pris par plein d'occupations, c'est difficile de trouver le temps. Ce n'est pas tout le monde au Canada qui est aussi euh, privilégié que nous, euh, qui avons le temps peut-être, ou, ou aussi motivé que nous, qui avons le temps euh, de s'impliquer en politique. Ce n'est pas 
pas tout le monde qui a ce luxe, ce n'est pas tout le monde qui a cette capacité euh, de le faire. Il faut donner des instruments aux citoyens pour leur permettre une plus grande participation dans la vie démocratique. Uh, very briefly, we need to allow uh, 16, uh, 16 and older, uh, the vote of 16 years old and older. Uh, I think it's crucial that we have uh, strong participation on the part of our youth. Uh, the decisions that are taken today will have a, a massive impact on their future. And so they need to have a voice and a place at the table. Uh, I think we should start discussing the utility or the fairness, in fact, of polling and the impact that polling has on participation uh, and, and turnout rates. Uh, when, uh, when it becomes clear and is being uh, peddled by media constantly that this party or this party will win with a majority or even a minority, then people are less inclined to want to take the time to go out and vote because they think, well, you know, the, 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 the cards, uh, the cards are already, uh, already uh, decided. Uh, and so uh, I'm not, I'm simply not going to show up and won't vote. So I think we need to have a discussion around the, the question of polling. Uh, finally, you know, Being, take, be, being involved in politics demands time and resources. And that is not something that a lot of Canadians uh, have currently in this economic model. Uh, the Green Party is the only party that has been consistently advocating for uh, a, a universal livable income. Uh, and we need to push that forward if we are to allow uh, not only time, but also the resources to take part in our communities, to take part in politics. Uh, I don't think we can generalize the interest that fair vote members or Green Party members or the members of any political parties have uh, towards politics to the entirety of, of the population. When you're struggling to pay your rent and uh, have to take your kids to the kindergarten, uh, you have to uh, deal with your mom who's sick, you might not have the time uh, or the desire or the interest or the mental space even to, to, to take part in the crucial decisions that uh, will affect our lives. And so we need to give Canadians the tools uh, to participate in our democracy. And that's not simply by creating new structures. It's also by giving them the means to do that. Merci. And over to Anna next, please. Okay, merci, Gisela. Uh, je vais juste ajouter un peu à uh, la réponse de Chad. Um, la représentation proportionnelle est bien en, au cœur de notre priorité en, en matière de, de réforme démocratique, mais uh, une un autre priorité de notre plateforme est, um, et je, je veux mettre un accent sur, sur cette uh, priorité et um, que le Canada doit soutenir les Premières Nations qui souhaitent se libérer de la loi sur de, les Indiens, d'atteinte de l'époque coloniale, en appuyant un processus dirigé par les communautés autochtones visant à rétablir une véritable uh, autonomie, et self-governance. So, so this is about, for those who don't speak French, it's um, the, the, our First Nation communities have been, you know, governed under the Indian Act for, for so long. And, um, there is this amazing um, indigenous revitalization and a renaissance that is happening at the moment. And seeing through the, the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission involves allowing those communities to, to exit from under the governance of the Indian Act and to revitalize their traditional, um, their traditional uh, self-governance. And so making sure that there is space for this, I've been reading a lot of Jody Wilson-Raybould's work on this um, over the last few years and making sure that we're supporting that process and enabling all of the, the diversity of uh, First Nations across the country to, to re-establish their own self-governance and, and to have a true nation-to-nation -nation relationship rather than a colonial um, relationship, I think is key. Um, nous devons également uh, accueillir attention à, à l'expression démocratique dans l'ère numérique, ou de digital democracy, um, le, le démocratie dans, dans l'âge digital. Um, la réglementation um, contre la désinformation et la, la misinformation, la fausse information, um, est essentielle parce que le, le média so socio, les réseaux sociaux, um, uh, Yeah, the social media enables proliferation of misinformation and um, le, le media social sont développés très rapidement, mais la réglementation uh, doit rattraper son, son retard. So we have to catch up our, our regulation 
um, to where social media has gotten us in the last few years. And there's been some really interesting initiatives, including the Citizens Assembly on Democratic Expression that has run in 2020, 2021, and 2022. The government hasn't supported or, or promoted um, this really interesting initiative um, enough in, in the eyes of the Canadian public, but we have had a Citizens Assembly on Democratic Expression running the last three years, and it's come up with some very interesting results that I think are going to take us in the right direction. So we need to continue to see that process through. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Anna. Lucima. Merci. Euh, donc, il y a beaucoup de bonnes idées là, dans ce que mes collègues apportent. Euh, moi, ce que, puis, il y en a beaucoup que je pourrais appuyer là, de, de toutes ces idées. Euh, ce à quoi j'ai pensé pour une autre réforme importante, c'est la, la réforme du Sénat, donc euh, soit de l'abolir ou de le le, élire le Sénat. Donc, je, je pense que si euh, un organe de, euh, qui, qui est désuet, c'est bien le, le Sénat où on nomme des gens euh, pour le restant de, de leur vie là, à un siège. So, so, like I was saying, like my, I would uh, support uh, most of the ideas of my colleagues. And what I thought that was important from my point of view also to, to, to reform is the, the Senate. So, we could like, uh, abolish the Senate or at least uh, elect the Senate. Now they, they've been named by the prime minister for life and uh, they have like their, their saying inside the, inside the institution. And I think that we need to pass to something else. And uh, that is very important. Uh, so that demands a lot of work, a lot of like we were talking about the uh, uh, coalition with other party to go forward. The liberals are not really like into that and neither the conservative. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, we need to work, uh, talk with them and and make sure those those ideas go forward and, and are still out there in the in the air and that we, we can work on those. Uh, C'est très important de garder ces sujets-là à l'ordre du jour, de toujours rappeler que on a un Sénat qui n'est pas élu, qui, euh, qui, qui prend des décisions importantes pour, pour les, 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 les citoyens et qui sont nommés par les deux grands partis. Et puis ça, ça dure depuis le, le début de la, la Confédération. Uh, so, I think that, that that should be very important and that uh, we should work on that. Uh, and uh, I, yeah, so that, that will be my uh, a priority that I think uh, in the reform that, that we should uh, put forward also. Thank you. Merci. And last but not least, Elizabeth, please. Merci pour la question. Je veux concentrer sur la question de réforme électorale, mais je veux souligner les bons points de mon, mon collègue et partenaire Jonathan parce qu'il est très important de d'impliquer les jeunes dans notre démocratie. Et j'ai euh, eu un projet de loi éminent de député dans le, euh, le Parlement passé pour le droit de voter à 16 ans. Uh, ce n'est pas, évidemment, ce n'a euh, pas réussi. Et dans ce Parlement, euh, mon projet de loi est euh, un, présenté par euh, un député MPD aussi. Il n'a pas gagné l'appui nécessaire. Mais c'était aussi important de, de mentionner le rôle des sondages pendant la période électorale. So quickly, for those who aren't speaking French, that uh, Jonathan and I totally agree. And I had a private member's bill to get to voting at 16. And I know one of the people watching us today in, in the chat is Dave Meslin, who's been running the championing that uh, work uh, along with Fair Vote to get young people involved in voting at 16. Because when you vote at 16, you're going to vote at 18 and 20 and 25. There's a strong case. Uh, also, again, the role of polls during the RIC period is very, very poor in terms of inclusion of voters to feel they have a role. If you're in a so-called safe conservative riding and you're told it's all over now, I mean, the low voter turnout in the Ontario election was a scandal and largely due to the media beating a drum like it's just a horse race, that, that it's all over now. Doug Ford gets a majority. Mais je veux ajouter aussi que je pense que c'est plus important de concentrer sur la question de vote proportionnel et pas seulement sur les questions de les moyens de, de notre su, uh, succès pour un réforme pour un vote proportionnel. Par exemple, les, les citoyens, les assemblées citoyennes, faire très, tellement important. Mais le but, c'est de changer notre système de vote. Pour moi, maintenant, je travaille sur un projet de loi éminent de député et la première étape dans le projet de loi, dans le, non, uh, ébouche, c'est d'avoir 
les, les assemblées na nationales pour les citoyens. Et j'ai dit non. Je veux mettre sur pied un projet de loi éminent de députés de changer notre système de scrutin, changer vers vote proportionnel avec un projet de loi immédiatement. So what I'm saying is that when I'm looking at how do we get to proportional representation, when we're making our steps forward, we're getting, I think, kind of bogged down in what's the best way to get there. Referendum, citizens' assemblies. I want to put forward a private member's bill that calls for a vote that says we're changing our voting system because far too many Canadians don't, number one, understand our existing voting system, first past the post, couldn't explain it if they were pushed to it. That's why it gets hard for us to explain proportional representation. It's harder to explain than to use. And we are not required by any constitutional tradition or other uh, aspect of our democracy to have a citizens assembly ahead of changing to get rid of first past the post. We had an election on it. It was in 2015. It was in the speech from the throne. Let's put forward the bill that moves immediately to getting rid of first past the vote for the post. Might not succeed the first time, but that's a more important conversation to have than how we organize ourselves in citizens' assemblies. It's not a large part of dispute. I, I largely am, I'm really proud to run with this group of people. Excellent presentations. Cette groupe de Canada, c'est très fort, très articulé, et nous sommes tout à fait d'accord avec l'un à l'autre. Mais je pense que c'est plus important de concentrer sur les raisons pour lesquelles on doit éliminer notre système de vote actuel. All right, thank you everyone. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, it's hard for me not to comment on these webinars. I'm used to having a panel and then I can say something like that was really interesting, but I'm trying to leave as much time as possible for everybody here to answer as many questions as possible. So the next uh, question that I wanted to touch on, I'm not going to read them verbatim, but, and I'm sure this is a familiar question to everyone on this call. It's about your relationship with the NDP. This one seems to be generating a lot of questions and a lot of chat. And so one of the earlier questions we got was, the NDP didn't make PR condition in the current confidence and supply agreement. What's your relationship with the NDP? How will you, how will you build that relationship? I'm sure you all get the gist of the question. So I think what we'll do is um, go in the opposite order this time. So I will start with Elizabeth, and then we'll go to Simone, Anna, Jonathan, Chad, and Sarah. So go ahead, Elizabeth. In terms of getting rid of the first past the post voting system, we shouldn't be have tunnel vision as though our only ally is going to be the NDP. They don't want to get rid of first past the post any more than the liberals or the conservatives. Let's be clear. Our relationship with the NDP, um, the Green Party Federal Council unanimously gave Jagmeet Singh the benefit of a leader's courtesy agreement in spring of 2019. And he accepted it and he might not have won his seat in Burnaby South if we had run a strong candidate or any candidate. We were, of course, remember that it, I, just in 2018, I'd been arrested in Jagmeet Singh's riding opposing the Kinder Morgan pipeline. We had a lot of support in Burnaby South. I mean, I didn't get arrested there because I was looking for electoral advantage for the Greens, but clearly we were strong there. And our local electoral district association or riding uh, was open to this idea that we should uh, build bridges. Well, the result of that, we didn't ask for any favors back for the NDP. I, I kind of wish we had because I, I, I wasn't expecting the NDP to spend a lot of money on Vancouver Island with voter suppression campaigns, uh, spreading lies about grains. I got them through my own mail slot in Saanich Gulf Islands, you know, claiming that I was against a woman's right to choose, claiming we were uh, a party that would that was uh, um, uh, going to cut spending to have a balanced budget that we were an austerity party L stuff that was so demonstrably false so our relationship with the ndp i i'd say what's the ndp is it the members of the ndp i think we have a strong relationship in most of our communities between green party local members and ndp local members i'd say day to day in the house of commons a great relationship with a bunch of ndp members as individuals but on anything when they have a whipped vote they vote against their principles. They vote against their policies when they're told to. I mean, there's a reason that I was the only member of parliament to vote against bombing Libya in June, 2011. 
every single NDP member of parliament voted against their policies, against their principles. And I can't tell you how many NDP members of parliament came up to me pretty soon after the big election, sweeping in Quebec, particularly Quebec women, NDP members of parliament came to me. Oh, Madame May, oh, Madame May. Tears streaming down their face because they had just stood up and voted for bombing when they were every fiber of their being was against that vote. So we need to build bridges, but in terms of getting rid of first past the post, let's. I, I know people aren't gonna wanna hear this, but the popular vote in the last two elections went to the conservatives. We may have more allies within the conservative party in getting rid of first past the post than we have in the NDP. But the goal is to make sure that we elect more greens so that we stop a false majority for either liberals or conservatives, and then make a condition of working with either or any party that getting rid of first past the post is an unbreakable condition for cooperation with any party. All right, thank you, Elizabeth and Simon. So thank you for the question. So I understand that the uh, that the experience of Elizabeth regarding like uh, uh, NDP could make her a little bit pessimistic for their uh, support to that. But I think we need to keep an open mind and uh, keep in mind that it may happen. Uh, you know, like the things may align. And so we need to be there and like be able to 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 answer that and use that moment that uh, uh, where they're going to be ready to do it. And for that, we need to keep an open mind and not eliminate uh, any you know, uh, solution or possibility that that's out there. And NDP is one of them. And I agree that uh, also the conservative is, if like they realize one day that it will uh, maybe advantage them, uh, they will also like be in for uh, electoral reform. Uh, I think that also we should talk to Mr. Trudeau, keep, you know, talking like, at the last election, and but not the last one, in 2015, he did this, his campaign on the electoral reform. And then after, I remember, I was a little bit shocked when he said that. He said, oh, we don't need it anymore. I've been elected and Mr. Harper is not there. People wanted to get rid of Mr. Harper and now I'm there. So we don't need one anymore. I was a little bit shocked when he said that. I was like, he's really serious. And now maybe we could like just, you know, bring to his attention that uh, very soon, uh, people are going to want to get rid of him and uh, elect somebody else. So maybe it's time for him also to think about, you know, leaving something to Canada, like uh, an, an heritage or, you know, a mark. He want, he's looking for something. He wants to beat uh, Wilfred Laurier. Maybe he could, you know, bring something more, something that will make Canada go forward. And I think they understand, like, it's like, to go that way, it's just logical for any democratic country. And it's like, I think, that, you know, they're intelligent people, like if we keep bringing it to their attention and and talk about it and like, and then they will be one day was like, they will have the, the chance to put that, you know, uh, uh, on the table and make it realize it and uh, it will happen. So we need to be, you know, optimistic, work hard. I know sometimes it's difficult because, you know, they're just like thinking about their party and it's like first past the post, make it like uh, almost like a... Uh, I was looking at the, the email you sent like uh, regarding Denmark and, and it's so like interesting to know that 98% of the people, people said that they vote for, for an MP that they wanted to, like they vote for him. And that here in Canada, 52% are voting against somebody. They're not even voting for somebody. It's like, it's so uh, an evidence and, and that's, you know, that's real democracy. So I think if we keep, you know, talking to them, like, talking to their intelligence they will you know like put the 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 the, the greater goods of canada at first and uh, we will finally uh, get there so yeah coalition and uh you know partnership with every uh party that's ready to go forward on that uh, on that uh, that policy thank you thanks simone i'm just gonna give a gentle reminder to people we're not doing timers and all that kind of stuff but just um try to keep your answers a little bit more concise just so that everybody has a chance to answer everything. So next we will go to Hannah. 
Thank you, Anita. Um, I, I, I think timing is actually a really good suggestion because I can see there are 50 questions in the, in the Q&A and I'd love to answer as many of them as possible. So I'm going to try to keep my responses to, to one minute voluntarily and I'll suggest that to the other candidates as well. Um, in terms of relations with the NDP, um, we know on climate and on proportional representation that they have good policies on their books, but they don't necessarily follow through. And we also know that there are factions within the NDP of truly progressive people who I think share green values 100% and should probably be running with the Greens instead. Um, but those factions are continually uh, suppressed by you know, the, the leadership. I've heard it very directly from friends of mine who work in the NDP, who've run with the NDP, saying, you know, the, the leader's office does not prioritize these issues. There's a small caucus of us who do. And so we need to think about that. You know, there's there's been proposals for one-time alliances and so on. I'm, I'm not convinced that um, that's the best way to go to just like align with or, or to have like cooperation between the Greens and the NDP, but we need to put pressure on the NDP and on the Liberals and on the Conservatives to lift um, their level of ambition on all of these on all of these issues, especially climate and proportional representation. And we need to start to build bridges across the aisle. Um, and I know it's, it's not start, we need to continue to build those bridges where um, there are progressives in those parties, even conservatives now are starting to talk about proportional representation um, with the election of Pierre Poiliev, and I think that presents a very important um, strategic opportunity for this movement. Thank you, Anna. And next we have Jonathan. Thank you for the question. My priority and Elizabeth's priority is to make sure that the party, the Green Party of Canada, is back on track, so that it's able to elect as many members of Parliament as possible. And that will require us to be to, 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 to lead a strong campaign nationwide and to call out the NDP, the Liberals, and the, 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 the Conservatives uh, on all of the hypocritical stances that they've had uh, for so long. I think it's high time that we propose to Canadians a functional, actionable alternative uh, as Greens, uh, and we can do that if we, uh, you know, if if, if members, uh, you know, following. I, I, I do I do want to say we have very strong candidates uh, all over, but I think Elizabeth and I will be able to to do that uh, more quickly. Now, uh, you know, I'm, Anna is not the only one with lived experience of uh, proportional representation and and and. Um, coalition governments. I've lived in Norway for five years. It's a place where. Uh, coalition governments are happening all the time. They are actually extremely stable. Uh, I think they bring forward uh, the value of uh, bringing more extreme parties closer to the center. We've had, uh, for most of the time that I was living in Norway, a conservative government that included, in fact, the far right in its cabinet. And that had the result of uh, not only including them in the government, meaning they were less able to then criticize the institutions and you know do the kind of stuff that we're seeing Poiliev do at the moment, uh, but also brought them to espouse much more, uh, much much more uh, milder uh, policies uh, as part of that, as part of that government. So I do believe that uh, coalition governments would represent best uh, the interests of Canadians if we. If we were so unlucky as to end up with the Poiliev uh, minority government, then I think there would be a very uh, big opening for us as progressives to work more together uh, with the NDP, with the Liberals, uh, with the one condition, and with the Bloc Québécois, with the one condition that we do have PR uh, as as item uh, number one, and that we uh, that but and that we we form we propose a coalition government uh, to the Governor General if we were to uh, to uh, to uh, to take them down on a confidence vote. Um, but in order to do that, in order to be able to, to, to participate in such coalition efforts or coalition building efforts, we need to come in uh, from a place of strength, and that requires us to elect as many uh, Green members as possible. And that is what I will be focused on uh, until, until the period and after. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'll go to Chad. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the question. So absolutely, we need to have strong campaigns to elect as many Greens as we can in order to get official party status. So that's a minimum of 12, but also to uh, have an influence on the balance of power within Parliament so that we can force uh, a situation where we are in a position to negotiate with the, you know, either the other parties to create a coalition, as Jonathan just said, or the party that has the closest to majority to force rep uh, 
proportional representation to be implemented. And that's actually a red line for Anna and I. Any supply and confidence agreement that we would go into with any of the governments would be proportional representation, not just uh, a committee to review it, but implementation of proportional representation as a starting point for a negotiation. Um, and to do that, we do need to build a strong yeah, Green Party base, able to win elections, able to run campaigns in 60 to 100 ridings across the nation. And Anna and I have a very solid plan to get us there. And we also have the experience and know-how to do the training necessary and provide the skills necessary to get those Greens elected and have those strong campaigns. Because we know that target to win or even coalition, you know, one-time agreements with the NDP will not necessarily get us there we need to make sure that we're running 60 to 100 strong campaigns so that we can elect 12 or more green mps because we know that even if we target to win or even if we make those alliances with the ndp that doesn't guarantee a win that just maybe guarantees a stronger performance we want to proliferate strong performances for the greens across the country uh, and and we think our green leaders network will be an excellent way to do that an excellent way to get in and building trust in communities uh, across the country that the green party doesn't only lead by rhetoric but leads by example and by action and should we be faced i'm happy that jonathan brought up the situation of perhaps a conservative uh, coalition should we be faced with a conservative government that only requires one other party to to form government as I said before, our red line will be proportional representation to begin that process. If we can pull them to the left and, and get them to abandon their principles to adopt ours, then we can start talking. And, and obviously, there would be more than just proportional representation on the table at that point, because we don't want to bring in uh, a poly of government uh, without assurances that social policies would, would remain uh, and that we wouldn't be tearing down our democratic institutions. Our preference would be to build a coalition with the other more progressive parties to ensure that we can move forward uh, for what's best for the future of Canada. But proportional representation and the implement implementation of that electoral reform would be at least the starting point for negotiations for us. So hopefully one day the NDP uh, <laughs> will be in a position to form, you know, a government with one other co with one other partner that could be us, and we could uh, work on that together. But until that point, uh, our focus is going to be on building the capacity of the Green Party to be competitive across the country in 60 to 100 ridings. And to do that, we need to build our capacity. And with our 25 years combined experience in campaigning in capacity building in citizens and community empowerment and social and economic development, Anna and I are the people to do it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. And we will finish off this question with Sarah. I have no relationship with the NDP. I have been deeply devoted to green political philosophy since 1991, and I have been hyper-focused on the Green Party of Canada and our institution, what things work and what things don't work, uh, since 2005. And in, two, in 2020, a small group of us got together, Grassroots Greens, and we created a group called the Constitution Working Group. I, uh, since, since I was very young, I, um, I started learning about uh, Gandhi and Satyagraha, um, active nonviolence. And, and that system requires that we work within a rules-based system. If you want to change the law, then first you have to change the law from within the law. And then I would ask everybody, can I, you know, greens and non-greens alike, to please go into the, um, to please go into the website and our website uh, for the leadership race contest. And if you go all the way to the far right, you will see that um, you can go into our member made policy process and you can click on VGM results and you can see that the very first top VGM uh, motion that we passed was to have our general meetings every year. And I put forward that motion. And you can go to the very bottom and you can see that the one that Greens voted down was dual leadership. So it is um, important that we follow our constitution. Um, it is true that our leaders are not allowed to speak against our six key principles. Chad earlier was referencing Article 7.3.11, 12 and 13. Um, but it is also important to note that we cannot, according to our own law, go against our member-made policy. 
So um, our constitution, or our constitution, <laughs> so our constitution does did say um, that we would always try to run a candidate in every riding. And so when we did make that deal with Jag Jagmeet Singh, um, that was in a way going against our constitution. And there were many Greens that had a hard time with it. Um, it was controversial. And we just had at our latest policy process, development process, um, just last year, we did agree to um, change our constitution. So I'm the only member that's pushing forward for a June 2023 um, general meeting. And we will have second when you want to change our constitution because it's a big deal. It has to pass at two general meetings. So if we do change that requirement to run a candidate in every riding, then that really changes our potential to strategize with the other parties around running or not running candidates. And so that is something to think about strategically. It will fundamentally change our ground game. And I've already spoken about it with my team. So in, in, in closing, I just want to echo um, what Elizabeth was saying earlier about um, making friends behind the scenes. Um, I'm very open to doing that. Um, I met Merritt Stiles, who will potentially become the leader of the uh, provincial NDP. And, and it's, it's important to make friends. But in the European-style coalition governments, you will see that, that it's really kind of not a good idea to set hard lines, to set conditions way ahead of time when we're not even in a position to negotiate yet. And it shows maybe um, that we're unwilling to move towards that coalition style government in which negotiation is key. We have no idea what the next vote will bring. And I find it a little bit dangerous to be setting hard lines so early as Greens. If there was, for example, a Pierre Polyev um, minority government and they required two or three green seats to prop them up, that would be a very controversial move. And I would not be willing to go forward with something like that as leader without having um, the backing of my two deputy leaders um, that I've chosen according to our constitution. Um, I've put forward already Christian Plouille, uh, an Ontario francophone um, for my deputy leader. And I would ensure that that the entire party is behind the idea of making a an agreement with um, a minority conservative. Um, yeah, I, I would never commit to something like that at this time. So thank you, everyone, and uh, miigwech. Okay, um, so we have one last question, and Gisela. Thanks, Anita. Um, so this question is, a combination of a couple that came through. Um, we know that proportional representation forces politicians to compromise and negotiate their differences. And yet it's clear that the Green Party leader would be um, tasked with uniting the party after uh, fairly substantial internal difficulties in, in recent years. So how would you as leader find a way to both allow for personal, uh, sorry, to allow for expression of diverse viewpoints and bring solidarity to the party. Oh, and I'm sorry, the, the order that we've chosen for this question is Anna, Jonathan, Sarah, Chad, Elizabeth, and Simo. So Anna, please go ahead. Can I just jump in for one second before folks start? Um, so I'm noticing it's 2.24 in Ontario, and that is six minutes left on this webinar, and we have six people, and we want to say thank you to everybody at the end. So if everybody could keep their answers to under a minute, that would be really great. Thank you. All right, please go ahead, Anna. Thank you. I'm sorry. I've just blanked on the question because I, I've had a bit of a headache throughout this whole. No problem. Uh, no problem. I'll repeat. Oh, it's it. how to unite the party. Got it. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Given that I've been feeling for a headache all morning and it just uh, it just kicked in. Um, right. So I'll just repeat it for everyone as well. So given that proportional representation forces politicians to compromise and negotiate differences, how would you as a leader? find a way to allow for both expression of diverse viewpoints and bring solidarity to the party in light of recent internal challenges. 
Yeah, so our, our role as leaders is not to suppress any group within the party. We know that there are different groups within the party who have different identities. Um, there are eco-socialists, there's the intersectional progressives, there's the old school environmentalists, there's the you know, indigenous activists. Um, and these are all critically important groups within the Green Party. And we need leaders who will empower and bring all of those groups together and say, you have the ability to push for your vision within the Green Party. What we don't want to see is factionalism, where those groups are at war with each other. Um, know your principles, know where you stand, be able to speak those clearly and respectfully listen to others. That's the sort of culture that we want to set. Um, that's the sort of culture we want to bring forward. Um, we're not about you know, fighting or suppressing any voices within the party. That's the spirit of proportional representation in a broader parliament, and we would want to model that within the um, within the party as well. Um, I encourage people to check out the, the plan for our first six months. Um, that outlines very clearly step-by-step step in a very ambitious, but also realistic way, um, how we would be getting the party's governance back on track over our first six months of leadership so that we can get the party focused on where we want to be, which is talking about deepening our democracy, ambitious climate action, and the well-being economy. Thanks. Thank you, Anna. Jonathan, please. Thank you for the question. Um, I think we need to ask ourselves why we are green. And I think most, most green members are green members because they believe in uh, the six values of the green movement, because they believe in the need for stronger action on climate, and they, uh, they believe in the need for proportional representation and a strong voice in parliament to defend our democratic principles. Now, there are divisions as to how we are to achieve that. And that is normal. That's democracy. And I think we need to make, you know, we clearly need to make space for that. The last two years have been difficult, uh, but we can turn this ship around. Uh, you know, it, Elizabeth and I are fully committed, first and foremost, to stabilizing the party internally. We have different structures, inter internal structures, our federal council, our fund, the staff. Uh, these have been very difficult years for uh, people uh, who were part of these uh, these decision making bodies because uh, they were faced with all of these successive uh, media storms and had to take very quick decisions uh, on Zoom calls uh, while working for 30, 40 hours uh, as volunteers. That is not that's simply not sustainable. And on top of that, there was no underlying basis of trust because in the most part, most of these people had never met in person. So our first step really is to bring all of these people in the first place so that we can have uh, the, the trust building exercise and discussions that are needed for any institution to function well. Uh, there will always be divisions in any organization, and that is not only uh, that is not only normal. It's a good thing. It's a good thing because it pushes us forward. It forces us to revisit our our uh, our standing points, our uh, our our prejudices. Um, so we need to we need to create that space, uh, but that needs to happen internally. Uh, we need to have enough trust with one another to understand that if we disagree on something, it's not necessarily because uh, we want the worst for the party, or it's not necessarily because we are uh, part of the, the, the enemy. Uh, we need to learn to accept that sometimes the, the wind simply won't uh, go in our sails, uh, and sometimes it will. And it's a question of compromise, and that is exactly how politics, how we think politics should work uh, at the federal level, and there is no reason why it shouldn't work uh, exactly like that within the Green Party of Canada. Thank you, Jonathan. Sarah, please. If you go to my website, sarahgabriellebaron.ca, you will see that my fully transparent platform that has been out since the first week of this race has two sections. The outward policy section, in which, according to each, each of the six key principles, I've curated our member-made policy book. Greens have been getting together since 1988, and we create amazing policy, and it can and should create the base for everything that we do. And so I give the, the collective the credit, and I reference that member-made policy book with every single section, with every single plank that I've chosen. The second section is inward strength. In my 17 years as a member, I have found that it's the membership that is suppressed by a leader-centric, top-down centric system because we believe we have to play the game by the game's rules. However, when we do that, 
we hurt those leaders that, that we hurt those members that Jonathan was talking about. I've seen so many members leave over my 17 years in frustration and tears because we aren't valuing our volunteers enough. We aren't valuing our base enough. And so I represent a total shift in philosophy for the Green Party of Canada, not just in talk, but in actionable ways. And when you go to the Leadership Race website, you click on my six month plan, it's the exact same thing as my inward strength portion on my website. It's just put in point form. It's a little easier to consume, but it's the same document because I've been working towards this moment for 17 years. Thank you so much for your time. I do have to leave now because I have a 2.30 engagement, but this event has been really wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for joining us. And next is Chad, please. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak to this. You know, this is one of our top priorities. Anna and I have been, uh, well, we released our six month plan very early on in the race that has a pretty detailed process of how we hope to renew confidence and renew faith in the party with from within from within our membership to towards our leadership structures but within the canadian electorate as well and it starts with and jonathan aptly noted noted it it starts with rebuilding the bridges amongst our different decision making bodies notably the fund and uh the uh council and working together to get on the same page about where the mandate of one body begins and ends and same with the other, where it begins and ends and getting clarity there so we can address some of the tension uh, that's been building. And I've put our six month plan in the chat so you can go uh, check out in detail how we plan to address these things. But to bring unity more forthright throughout the membership, what we need to do is provide everyone an opportunity to take their ideas and bring them to the full potential and give everyone an opportunity to create the majority that they need to create in order to implement our part, the policies that they see as best for our party into our policy book because as Sarah aptly mentioned this is a member gra member led grassroots party and policies that we adopt and that the leaders are responsible for advocating for must come from the grassroots and must be uh must achieve a majority within the grassroots so as such we don't want to suppress any group which is something that's kind of been done in the past we want to elevate the voices of all members who have an idea and have an initiative they would like to put forward and give them an opportunity to get together and the resources, not just the opportunity, but the resources to build uh, messaging that can allow them to have a majority so that we can have those policies be implemented in our policy book. You know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, giving the collective the credit. We, Anna and I want to give the collective the resources to bring their policies forward and have a strong chance of putting them into our policy book. And we think that by doing that and by being transparent in our processes and bringing, opening up committees to members at large uh, to, to contribute to the decisions being made at the top, we can do the work of rebuilding that trust. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And next is, Chad. Oh, sorry. thank you, Chad. Sorry, I'm getting you mixed up. Elizabeth, please. Thank you. I want to start by correcting a few things just to make sure that all the participants know that we have not ever had our members reject co-leadership. I think this is something that both Anna and Chad would like me to correct as well as Jonathan and me. The last vote of members quite correctly decided that it would be a bad idea to say co-leaders would be the people who were the top two finishers in a leadership race. To be effective as co-leaders, and I think Anna and Chad demonstrate this as well as Jonathan and me, you need to have mutual trust, you need to work well together, you need to be a team. You can't let that be randomized. Uh, I also want to correct that the leader would never have the opportunity to decide to cut a deal with another party. It's always the leader working with the full council and with full membership. And while our party has had periods, which I admit I, I lament because I could not stop a certain amount of top-down control that was happening where the, the power in the party, much of the time that I was leader, was certainly not mine. Uh, there, were, there were moments where I was pushing back as best I could to defend EDA's rights to choose their own candidate, as an example. It, council makes a decision as a whole, the leader in this party has the power under our constitution to appoint two deputies and to appoint shadow cabinet, and that's it. Uh, our past leader managed to get new powers uh, through the use of a contract mechanism, and I think we have as a party, we're going to have to look at that, what mechanisms work. But to pull us together and respect differences, I rely on consensus decision-making, and that 
is back to our voting system. Let's pull out our copies of Art Leipart, Patterns of Democracy, and study it, because that tells us very clearly what voting systems are consensus-based and what systems are majoritarian and anti-democratic. And that's also true within the Green Party. Our constitution requires consensus decision-making. And when you are prepared to really work to consensus, everybody's in the room and everybody can come to consensus or you stand aside. We've had very large successes internally with listening to everyone and having a consensus process lead to agreement at the end of our biannual meetings. By the way, it hasn't been mentioned yet that one of those processes led the Green Party to decide that of all the PR systems that are available to us, we support mixed member proportional and our members have said that's the system we should support. I'm quite sure though, nobody would want us to reject single transferable vote because we wanted the hill we want to die on was to get mixed member proportional. The hill we will die on is to get rid of a perverse undemocratic voting system and that's first past the post. Thank you, Elizabeth. And finally to Simon. Thank you. So uh, to unify the party at the end of the race, I think it's very important to acknowledge like uh, the other candidates. So if I'm elected as a leader, for sure, I will like talk with all of them, see what role they want to play in the party. How could we use all their their knowledge, their experiences? And like some could be like a deputy leader, some could be critics on the on the the the, the cabinet fantôme. Uh, so those are all action that uh, I will put forward to make sure that we unify all the candidates and that they will be all candidates at the next election also, because I think they're all have like uh, uh, great experience, knowledge, and uh, that uh, the Green Party will benefit from. So that's very important. And for all the other uh, instances of the party, the members, the fund, the uh, the council, I think uh, we need to communicate, listen, listen a lot, and uh, understand and make sure everybody feel like they can express and uh, being heard. And uh, after, we need to go with the consensus and what uh, the members uh, uh, want to go with. And that will be my kind of leadership. And I will be brief, concise, and go to the point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Simone. I wanted to thank all the leadership candidates <clears throat> for taking the time to spend an hour and a half with us, slightly more, I apologize for that. Um, th it was a great event, we had a good discussion. Definitely there was a few things we do differently next time, hearing that feedback, I'm still appreciating the wonderful rich discussion that we had. And I wanna thank everyone, almost everyone uh, hung in with us for the entire time, which shows just how awesome everybody is really, because that is not always the case. <laughs> Uh, we, there was a ton of questions, so I would encourage those that had questions that didn't get answered to email the leadership teams directly and ask your questions. I'm quite sure they'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I'm going to put in, of course, a little plug for supporting Fairboat Canada. So as you log off today, you'll hit our donation page. Uh, we are a uh, organization that has one campaign staff. That's me. We are powered by passionate, dedicated, committed and stubborn volunteers for the past 20 years to drive this movement. So if you wanna support Fair Vote, uh, we could sure use your support. We especially value monthly donors. You all know this in the Green Party, how important it is. Our donors and our volunteers are the heart of Fair Vote Canada. If you wanna get involved, you can find out how to do that on our website. And if you wanna learn more about systems, because I saw the chat there, um, we offer a monthly 101 every month, and in February, we'll be diving into systems for those that want to get into those kind of weeds. So thank you again, everyone, for spending time with us, and I look forward to working with whoever uh, wins the Green Party of Canada leadership race. Bye. Thanks, Elizabeth.